Okay, so hopefully this works. Coach, I think we finally got you on, Coach. I think we're ready. So thank you to everybody who's been patient with me. Um, welcome to the Positive Podcast. And I am your host, Terrell Dozier. And our guest tonight, finally, is Dallas Mavericks assistant coach, Jenny Busek. There it is. All right, we got it. All right. We got it. <laughs> finally, we got you on. Finally, finally, finally. Thank you to everybody who's been patient through this, but we are definitely, definitely here, Coach. We are excited to have you on as a guest tonight. Appreciate you. Oh, I'm so happy to be on. I love what you're doing. I love what you're about. Thank you. Thank you. So let's jump right into it. We've waited long enough. Um, Talk to us about growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, who put the ball in your hands and how you fell in love with the game. Yeah, you know, I, I come from a family of academic people and sports were just for fun, but I grew, I came out of the womb just loving sports of all mm -hmm. types. So you give me a ball, you give me some competition, you give me some guys, and we were going to play all day long, played everything. Um, and, you know, all through high school, I even played – Three, three, four sports, but basketball was my my favorite. So, pickup basketball was it. If I could have played pickup basketball the rest of my life, mm -hmm. didn't need a crowd, didn't need a dollar. If I could have lived off of that, I think that would be my dream life. I would have showed up on any playground anywhere in the United States, any gym. Um, that's still like my heart, you know. So when I was making a college choice. Um, I was blessed to have opportunity to play different sports. Basketball was my best sport, but it was my favorite. Right. Um, but because it was my favorite, I chose to play basketball and was real fortunate to go to University of Virginia. Absolutely. So now you go from Tennessee down to Charlottesville, Virginia, and you play four years there. Talk about your four years there. Like you had a great career there. Talk about Talk about what it was like going from high school basketball playing college basketball at such a high level. Yeah, you know, it's a big decision for a young person to make is uh, which college you're going to attend if you if you have options and you're lucky enough to, to have options. Um, I chose Virginia because it was a great academic school. Um, and I didn't even know how good they were at basketball when I had looked into which college I really wanted to go to. Virginia was number one on my list. Then when I found out they were – at the time, number one in the nation in basketball. It was like best of both worlds. Um, I talked to a lot of coaches, a lot of schools, a lot of coaches promised me starting jobs, freshman year, this, that, and the other. I didn't want, I didn't want to hear that. I was a little bit different in that way because I, I felt like if you were telling me that, you either are not telling me the truth because you don't really know how I'm going to translate. It's not really fair to the players that are already there or you're terrible. So I wanted to go to a school, and Debbie Ryan at University of Virginia was like one of the only coaches that said, I don't know if you're ever going to play here. Right. <laughs> and I was like, okay, y'all must be good. You're honest. I'm in. So right. that's how I chose University of Virginia. Absolutely. So you had a great career, like I said there, four years starting. You wind up starting there. A thousand points, academic All-American, defensive player of the year, and – the team went a couple, you know, went to a couple of elite eights. So once basketball was over at the University of Virginia, at this time now, I think the WNBA is around, you know, which is great. You know what I mean? And I think you tried out for the Cleveland Rockers, it was. Yeah, interestingly enough, I graduated. I had a five-year double major. So my playing career ended in 96, and there was no WNBA. Okay. So my last game in college, I thought was was it, and mm -hmm. I, it was devastating. Which I know any high level athlete, anybody who loves the game, can remember the last game 
and goes through that grieving process, whether you're pro, college, high school, uh, when your career ends, it's painful. It's right. become such a big part of you. Mm -hmm. So I had like a six, eight month depression uh, mm -hmm. after that, because like there was no pro league yet. Right. Um, and so I mourned it, you know, and I grieved it and it was rough. And uh, thank God I had a good support system. And I was just finishing my degree, planning on going to med school, which was the original plan. And then in the midst of that fifth year, that's when the NBA said and showed like, hey, we're getting ready to start a women's league. And this is for real. Right. This is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like, you know, I'm not going to live, live it down if I don't at least try to play in this league that the NBA is starting. Right. And so I tried out for Houston. I tried out for Cleveland. Um, and it was like a rat race. I mean, it was right. like 400 people at the tryout coming right. from everywhere. Then the first cut goes down to 250. Then it goes down to 200, 150, 100. You just right. keep playing. Right. And I was so happy to be playing again. I hadn't touched the ball in eight months. Mm -hmm. I was in heaven just playing basketball again. I right. didn't care if I made the team or not. I was happy yeah. to be hooping, you know. Right. Um, and I happened to make the team in Cleveland. And uh, it was a huge blessing. Um, once in a lifetime opportunity, not just to play in the WNBA, but to mm -hmm. be a part of that inaugural season where we really felt all 80 of us, there were 80 players mm -hmm. at that time, um, that we were a part of something and we had a responsibility to try to get this league off the ground. And, and it was part of something that, that meant something and was going to be important for our world. Um, mm -hmm. There was great purpose and potential to this league for our culture, for women, um, and for young men to just have a different perception of women that they'd ever Absolutely. had. You know? Going Absolutely. to the games that first year, I mean, grown women would be in tears. <laughs> you know, Little girls looking up, like almost confused, like, right. and then little boys with our jerseys on, you know, like looking up to women in a different yeah. way for the first time. And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm young. I was only 21, but mm -hmm. this, this seems important. Right. Absolutely. It is absolutely very groundbreaking. So, um, you know, so you make the team, which is unbelievable. Then, but then you got injured. Yeah. So, so you had the ultimate high and then all of a sudden you had like the ultimate, you know, the ultimate low, like talk about that experience and, you know, then like going to play overseas and, and, that, and that journey. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I rode the bench. I was a rookie. We had a, we had girl women on our team that had been playing overseas 10, 12 years, you know, 35 years old. I, I didn't expect to play. I was making my, my paycheck was $10,000 for the season before taxes. And I couldn't believe I was getting paid to play basketball, you know? Yeah. And so I didn't care if I was giving the, the older players water or what, I was just so happy to be a part of this. Um, and then I got thrown in the game second half of a game in Charlotte. And I guess I must have done okay, because after the game, they're telling me I'm going to start the next game, which okay. was against LA, you know, Lisa Leslie, NBC, national yeah. TV. But I had jacked my back up in that, in that game, the, that one game. And I knew it was pretty bad, but I could, I could not sit out as a rookie my first game getting a chance to start, you know. Right. So I played through that. By the end of the game, I, I ended up in the emergency room. And, uh, and that was pretty much the end. It was a career-ending injury. I tried to play through it. I went overseas to Iceland, mm. played through it over there, had a great experience. I knew I was probably playing to the point of the end, but I, I was going to go out like that. You know, it was, player, it was teammates that I loved, a country that I loved, an experience that I loved, and I wanted to, to win championships for that team and go out like that. So that mm. was it. You know, I went out playing my best ball, winning championships, no regrets. And mm -hmm. I'd already grieved, you know, in college, like the death of my identity as a basketball player. So this was mm -hmm. a bonus for me. Right. And, uh, you know, I really had gone through the process of finding my identity and my worth in some other things. So when this ended, everyone was worried about me again, but you know, I was good. I was ready for whatever was gonna come next. Um, but my love for the game wasn't gone. And so that's the first time I thought, you know what? I'm not ready to go to med school. I want to stay a part of this league, try to help this league go somewhere and be something and do anything I can to help this league, you know, reach its potential. And so that's when I first started thinking about coaching. All right. Awesome. So we are on here with Dallas Mavericks assistant coach, Jenny Busek. I have a lot of young ladies who I've, who I've worked with over the years that are on. Thank you guys for joining in. If you guys have any questions, 
please feel free to put them in a box and we'll try to get to them before a coach gets off. So, so now you start thinking about coaching. Let's, let's go to 1999 now and, and you become assistant coach with the Washington, with the Washington Mystics. Talk about how, you know, the call, like how you got to that position, you know, did you, you know, obviously you had the, you know, the networking over the years and whatever, the, and they had you come in. How did you feel about, you know, once you got that first coaching job, because now like your career is kind of over and it's like, okay, what do I do next? And I love the game. And now I get a chance to, to give back by, by coaching. Talk about that first experience. Yeah. You know, like I mentioned, playing in the WNBA that first year, I really, it, it meant a lot to me and it really gripped my heart. I wanted to be a part of the WNBA. I wanted to help the players in the WNBA. You know, it wasn't a great experience that first year because there was no coaches in the league that had ever played professional basketball or been a part of professional basketball. And so the players, this should have been the best job in the world. And it was a lot, we had a long way to go in terms of the experience. So I felt like I wanted to serve the players, try to help players have a great experience playing professional basketball. And I wanted to help the league succeed. And so I told my mom, mom, I want to coach in the, in the WNBA. And she's like, well, sweetheart, you know, I mean, you've never coached, you know, don't you think you should start like in college or high school or something? I'm like, no, nope. WNBA is where I want to be. So I wrote a letter to every coach in the WNBA and I said, I, I want to coach and I want to help and I'll do it for free. I, I don't care if I have to eat cereal, live on somebody's basement floor. Like I just want to be a part of the WNBA and I offered my services for free to all eight teams. Um, I, actually at that time it was 10 teams and Nancy Darsh, who was with the Washington Mystics, said, you know, I don't have a paying position, but we'd love to have you. She had coached against me both in WNBA and in college. And mm -hmm. um, she coached the great Katie Smith at Ohio State yes. when I was at Virginia. And so she's like, if you if you can swing it, we'd love to have you. So I went and I lived in some family's basement apartment and didn't get paid. And mm -hmm. we lost a lot of games. And coaching staff was getting booed. Shamika Holesquaw was a rookie and she was great, but we were terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in heaven and I knew like this, this is my thing right now. This is my thing. I want to be a part of this league and I want to help these players. Awesome. Awesome. So for there, now you go down to Miami. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. a few, for a few years. So um, was that kind of like the same thing or you got your chops wet? Now they have a paying position down there now. Yeah. So, Pat Riley hired Ron Rothstein down in, in Miami. Mm -hmm. And Ron happened to be an assistant coach with the Cleveland Cavaliers when I was playing in Cleveland. He used to come to a lot of our practices, a lot of our games. Mm -hmm. And he made a mental note watching me like, yo, that Boosette kid, she, she would make a good coach one day. Okay. Just goes to show you for the young, young players out there, like you never know who's watching. Absolutely. And you want to represent yourself in a way that, somebody's watching you they want you to be a part of what they're doing it could be the janitor it, that grows up into a gm one day but be good to people be respectful of people and know that somebody might be watching and you want to always carry yourself in that way so he ends up in miami with pat riley and he starts asking around like anybody know if that is does that boost that kill still playing what's she doing and somebody told him i had gotten into coaching and he called flew me down there and uh, not only hired me, but he became my coaching mentor, more so my father in, huh. in the coaching, coaching world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I owe almost everything that there is in basketball to, to him. Shout out to Ron Rothstein. Shout yeah. out. New York. All right. Yeah, baby. So, so you're there for a few years. Then you go yeah. from Miami. Then you go out to Seattle. Yeah. Um, you know, where you were an assistant coach and during their championship season. So, and I think Sue Bird was out there then. Oh, yeah. So talk, yeah. So talk about, you know, what it's like to get out there and, and now all of a sudden coach a team that has now um, won a championship. Well, they hadn't won one yet. We, Ann Donovan got hired. Mm. Um, God bless her soul. Yes. She passed this year, but um, she got hired and she was like pro women. She, she thought that women should be coaching women. Yeah. And, but there was a lot of NBA coaches in the league at that time that were mm -hmm. really doing well. And so she knew that to keep up and to be successful and she needed NBA knowledge, but she didn't want to hire a man. Right. So I was the first woman because of Ron that 
had gotten exposed to MBA knowledge uh, that became available. So she hired me to bring MBA knowledge to her staff. We had an all female staff and we ended up winning a championship in our second year together there uh, with the great Sue Bird, the great Lauren Jackson, um, and a great supporting cast, Cherie Sam, Betty Lennox, Camilla Vidichka, just MVP role players and two young stars. It was, it was a lot of fun just to win with, with young stars that were playing still with the childlike joy and innocence. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a treat. It was a real treat. Absolutely. For those who don't know who Lauren Jackson is, you youngsters, look up Lauren Jackson. She was a hell of a player. Hell of a player. Um, so you're there till 2005, and then you take a year off in 2005, and then you come back with the, San, uh, with the Sacramento Monarchs. Yeah. So you were so you were there for a couple of years, and then you went back to Seattle. So you were staying busy in this coaching game the whole time, you know, and which is good because a lot of people don't. And then you become the head coach now of the Seattle Storm in 2015. So talk about the difference between being an assistant coach and now being the head coach. Yeah, yeah. So 2005, I, I was kind of just – having to reevaluate, was I, was I still doing what I was supposed to be doing or was I doing it because it's just what I'd been doing and what everybody expected me to do and, and I'd become successful at. So I felt like for my soul, I needed to take some time, step away and just, just check in, you know, on whether I was living the right life for me, you know, whether I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And so I took time off and really just got away from it and opened myself up to getting away from it, doing something else, going back to med school, whatever. And I was out of it, you know, and I really got away from it. I didn't watch games. I kept in touch with the players, tried to keep encouraging them, but I really was just not going to coach anymore and, and open myself up to other things. In the midst of that, the Sonics called and, said they needed an East Coast scout. I was back in my hometown in Nashville. So I started scouting, doing advanced scouting for the Sonics. Um, got me back in the, in the game a little bit, mm -hmm. woke my appetite up a little bit. And then out of the blue, like seven o'clock in the morning, the GM of the Sacramento Monarchs calls and says, hey, I'm retiring from coaching and I want you to be the next head coach of the Sacramento Monarchs. I don't want to interview anybody else. Right. So get on a plane. You're going to meet with the Maloofs and me in Las Vegas at the Palms Hotel and let's get this done. And I was like, I was 31, you know, very young, had no aspirations of being a head coach. But, you know, sometimes if you just are trying to stay true to yourself, follow your heart, be honest with yourself, um, make the most of every moment, then life's path just leads you where you're supposed to be. So I really didn't want to do this, but I felt like it was what I was supposed to be doing. And so I was very scared to accept this job as young as I was. It was a veteran team. Half the team was older than me. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like it was what I was supposed to be doing. So I went there, had a great experience, but it is a huge difference. Ron used to always tell me, when you move six inches over, yeah. everything changes. <laughs> Absolutely. That pillow is not as comfortable at night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your world changes six inches. Right. And, and it couldn't be more true, you know, but it was a great experience for me, especially as a young coach to mm -hmm. get thrown into the fire, because if you have aspirations of being a head coach, you can only prepare so much right. as an assistant coach. And then right. you just got to dive in head first, take your lumps and figure it out on the fly, you know. And, and so it was intense, but it was it was great. Um, and then that that ended me and that brought me back to, to Seattle, as you mentioned, and we won another championship there and. Um, had a second head coaching opportunity. So got to revisit things with, with Sue Bird. Absolutely. And, then and your other was... New Yorker, Brianna Stewart. Yeah, yeah, Brianna Stewart. Lots of New York and... blood. <laughs> and, and Jewel Loy was there Jewel too. Lloyd, so, yeah. <clears throat> so I had, um, you know, I had my friend Steve Silas on here. And, you know, while, you know, people look at head coaching jobs, whether it be in the NBA or the WNBA, like it's great. You know what I mean? It's such a, a glamorous position, but how excited you was at the at the Palm Hotel and being offering offered this head coaching position. Talk about what it's like to the other side where it's like to be let go. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So again, you know what I mean? Because that's part of it too. Like it's great that you get the job, but you actually things have to go right for you 
to keep that job also. So talk about that a little bit too, because I want my, you know, I want everybody to hear about the highs and the lows. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> excuse me. You're going to have disappointments in this game if you stay oh, here long enough. It's life. It's, it's life. You know, if, you know, I've got a, a, a daughter that's almost two years old and I'm already trying to prepare her for falling down and disappointments and, and to be good with that because mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot more of that, especially in coaching mm -hmm. um, than you will in anything else. You know, you can't be a good player if you're afraid to make mistakes. You will never be a good head coach until you're not afraid to get fired. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll take it a step further. And a lot of people in our, our business will tell you, and I will quote Ron a lot because like I said, he's my mentor and he's, he's like Yoda um, in the coaching world. And he told me, you're not even a head coach, like a real head coach in pro basketball until you've been fired. Like, it's not a matter of if, it's when. <laughs> and right. so just get prepared follow your convictions, make your decisions every day to the best of your ability, what's best for this team. Don't try to please the fans. Don't try to please the players. Don't try to please management. Stay true. Um, make the best decisions you can where you can look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day because at some point it's going to happen if you're a head coach long enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, and I didn't know that you um, were doing scouting for the Sonics, so you kind of already got your feet wet in the NBA with the advanced scouting and everything. So now after the whole Seattle Storm situation, now you become a player development coach for the Sacramento Kings now. And I think at the time, correct me if I'm wrong, you were the third female assistant coach in the NBA at that time, correct? Yeah, no, that's right. You know, and I, I was I was in a devastated place because I had um been in Seattle 11 out of 14 years. I had won two championships with that franchise. They hit rock bottom when I was associate head coach with Brian Agler, and we, we finished last place in the WNBA in 2015. Mm -hmm. And they made a change, and they asked me to take over this rebuild. And I knew it was going to be a heck of a task. Like, it was mm -hmm. going to be – it was going to require all of me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most coaches that take over a rebuild don't get a chance to see it through, and I knew that too. Right. So we had a lot of conversations. I felt like if loyalty existed in this business, it was going to exist right here with me in the storm. So I'm going to give them all of me and do all this grunt work to do this rebuild and lay out the vision, a five-year plan back into championship contention. Um, and so that's what I did. I gave, the, I gave it everything I had. We laid out a plan, four or five-year plan, get back in championship contention. And I wasn't able to see it through. They let me go in the third year. Um, okay. and, and I was heartbroken. Like this was personal to me. It wasn't like getting fired the first time. Like this one was like, Seattle was like my home, you know, and that franchise I'd grown up in. Um, and so that was painful. But like you said, like everything happens for a reason that that happened. And it wasn't but a few weeks later, the Kings are calling asking me to come hang out. Dave Yeager. Um, at that time, Becky Hammond was the only, uh, only female coach in the NBA. And everybody was saying, like, yeah, it's working in, in San Antonio, but San Antonio is like Disney World. Like, it'll work there, <laughs> but it won't work anywhere else. Right. So nobody was open to hiring women, you know, mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. So when Dave called, Dave Yeager, he is a good friend. He's a good man. He's an unbelievable coach. And the opportunity to just hang out with those guys, it wasn't with the job, was, like, healing to me. Mm -hmm. So I went down there to hang out with that coaching staff. They took me in. We just start talking hoops. They throw me on the court with the guys. I'm just having fun being back around the game that I love again. It's healing my heart and uh, turned into an opportunity. And uh, what a blessing that, mm -hmm. that was, you know, just to be with that staff, that team, young team, great guys, and to be in the NBA, you know, something I wasn't trying to do or um, ha wasn't applying for jobs or anything, but mm -hmm. um, was, was able to have an opportunity to get into. Absolutely. So obviously you've worked with some great professional women's players. Um, yeah. Talk about the difference though. Like now, like you're, you're, you're working with DeMarcus Cousins and like, you know what I mean? And all these guys who are like, you know, um, big time players, like talk about the difference or were your philosophies the same, whether it was Sue Bird or whether it was, you know, Boogie Cousins. I, I tell people all the time, 
there are a lot more similarities than there are differences. Mm -hmm. Coach, you're coaching the best athletes in the world, in the WNBA and in the NBA. Mm -hmm. These are the top-notch competitors. These are players that standards of excellence, work ethic, intelligence, emotional IQ. It's best in the world. Mm -hmm. So they have way more in common than they have differences. There were some subtle differences, but my coaching style, because I started coaching so young, I mean, and for the first 10 years, at least in my coaching career, most of the players I was coaching were older than me. Um, my leadership style has always been serve, you know, and try to learn and be a good resource so that I can serve and work together with these geniuses and try to help unleash the genius. Right. My leadership style has never been, even as a head coach, dictatorship, because I say so. And so that didn't change, coaching men, coaching women, trying to figure out how I could help the guys, what they needed, um, and what I had, you know, to be of, serv of service to them and to the staff has always, has always been my heart. Um, there's not a lot, of, a lot of difference, to be honest. And because of the WNBA, um, and it's been around so long, these young men, they grew up best friends with female players, going to all the WNBA games, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them were raised by strong females mm -hmm. and are very comfortable <laughs> being bossed around by, by women. Okay. So it was, it was a much smoother transition than I think a lot of people would think. Right. Okay. So now talk about, so you were in Sacramento and then the next year you ended up in Dallas. So what happened between that time that you made the jump from Sacramento to Dallas? Yeah, it was crazy time. You know, I think it's pretty public. I got pregnant. Um, you know, something that I was trying to do my last year coaching in Seattle through IVF. I was doing it on my own. I didn't have a partner. Hadn't been married. Um, <clears throat> excuse me real quick. And uh, so I'd been trying for, for months and months and months to, to have a kid because I was getting older and I didn't want my whole life to be coaching. I wanted to have a family. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a mother, not just a coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't work out the way that I thought. I hadn't met anybody. I'd given my life to coaching. I married this, this profession. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids were my heart. My players were my family. And um, I didn't really have a, a lot to give anywhere else. So anyways, long story short, decided that it was time for me to try to start a family and I was going to have to do it on my own at that point. Cause I was running out of time. It wasn't working. The last attempt that we tried, I was flying to Seattle on my days off when I was coaching in, in Sacramento. And it was a long shot, but I, I ended up getting pregnant right when I got that job. Right. So I was pregnant the whole season. By the end of the season, I was six months pregnant. Um, I hadn't told anybody, but, but coach Yeager and, uh, and so at the end of the season, I'm pregnant, and I thought, I'm done coaching in the NBA for sure. Like, maybe coaching period, but I'm done coaching. There's no way I can coach in the NBA with a baby, single, mom, you know. So I, I was really resigned to that. Um, but long story short, I had two other teams, one of them being Dallas, call and want to interview me. I was very honest. Look, I'm seven months pregnant. I'm going to have a kid. I'm not going to be able to travel, at least early on. Um, if that doesn't work for you, I get it. But mm -hmm. this is my situation. Right. Sacramento, this other team, which I won't say, um, and Dallas, were all willing to work with me on that. And mm -hmm. I, could not, I could not believe it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I had a decision to make, and Dallas just felt – right and i ended up in dallas with my one month old baby in august yeah wow wow and then you had that you had that uva connection with rick carlisle mm -hmm. and then obviously you know you know i'm willing to put up mark cuban against any owner in the nba what he you know the things that he does and you know he's a he's a first class owner for sure yeah yeah no doubt i mean i i have not one bad thing to say about sacramento it's not even really a comparison. It was more just like a global decision mm -hmm. and a, an intuitive decision. SAC was good to me. Mm -hmm. they, they were good to me. 
I have nothing but love for Sacramento. My daughter was born there. Mm -hmm. um, I had two great runs there. Mm -hmm. Nothing but love for the fans, the players, the organization. Um, but, you know, Dallas is a great organization, too. And, and Sent Marshall and, and Mark Cuban and Rick Carlisle, the leadership that we have here, um, just super supportive and proactive with game planning for me how to be not just a mother um, while I'm coaching, but to be a good mother. And they've right. been really, really above and beyond helping support, you know, me not just being a mom, but being a good one. I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So talk about, you know, one of the thing, one of the biggest things for me is being, you know, you know, one of the few female NBA coaches. And, you know, for me, it's like, you know, when I grew up, you know, there were certain things that we thought we, we might not ever see, you know what I mean? And, you know, as an African-American, like, you know, to see a black president, like, you know what I mean? So for like these young girls now, you know, it's all of a sudden, it's like they're growing up in a time where women are in the NBA, like women aren't limited anymore. So talk about being like one of the trailblazers and, you know, what would you like to see more with like young ladies getting into the league and what would you be your advice for them? Yeah. You know, I never had, this sounds crazy and I know this is against the norm, but I never had long-term goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think they can get you in trouble a little bit because you know, you're, you're focused more on the destination as opposed to the journey. And I've always been under the belief that, um, you know, if you really stay true to who you are, really work hard at figuring out who you are, what your gifts are, your talents, what you're passionate about, figuring out your purpose, um, which is a tough exercise, but mm -hmm. that's where I would start and stay. Mm -hmm. Once you know that about yourself, like what your strengths are, your weaknesses, your passions, your gifts, and are unapologetic about your strengths and your weaknesses and your purpose in life, then I think it helps give you like a roadmap that you take one step at a time. Um, and then you'll end up where you're supposed to end up. Like, for example, I never had plans to play professional basketball. It, it didn't even exist. I didn't even have plans on playing college basketball. Right. But I was loving playing in middle school. I was loving <laughs> playing in, in high school. And I just was loving it every day and trying to be the best I could be every day. And then that one thing led to the next, led to the next, led to the next. But if it hadn't, I would have had no regrets because I knew I would have known that I gave it all that I had and I enjoyed every single step of the process and every single day. And then if you end up wherever, then that's where you're supposed to be. And if you don't end up wherever, it's not where you're supposed to be and you'll end up where you're supposed to be, if that makes sense. So instead of the long-term planning, which I think can set you up for disappointments that are unpredictable, uncontrollable, if you can stay in tune with who you are, what you're meant to be, where your happiness is, where your contentment is, where your passion and your purpose are, being the best version of yourself every day, the path will make itself known to you. Um, and maybe that's NBA, maybe that's WNBA, but it's no more valuable to be coaching on the pro level than it is on the middle school level or the 10-year-old level. Coaching is coaching and everybody's called to different levels. And I'm no more valuable than somebody who's coaching 10-year-olds because I'm coaching in the pros. They're, if they're called to the 10-year-olds, they're just as valuable. And I think that's really important that we understand. Maybe it's not perceived that way, but it shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't be. Our job as a coach is to help players become the best version of themselves they can be as both a player and a human being. And if we do that, it shouldn't matter where we're coaching, how much money we're getting paid, whether we're on TV or not, we're, we're a successful coach. So what is your, so what is your, in your short-term goals right now, what are your short-term goals in coaching right now? And if you could, like, is a long-term goal, maybe one day can you see a woman sitting six inches over in the head coaching seat. I, I don't have, I never had a goal to be a head coach in the WNBA. Yeah. Um, but I've learned the hard way never to say never in this life. Mm -hmm. um, my first head coach job in the WNBA, I went into it kicking and screaming. 
I felt like if I didn't do it, I would have been disobeying God. I mean, that's how strong my convictions were that I'm supposed to be doing this, but I don't want to. So I don't know where the, the path is going to take me. I don't even know if I'll be coaching next year, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not that far ahead. This, this whole stuff with the quarantining and the, the NBA, we don't even know if we're going to finish our season. Right. So I'm trying to do great projects for our coaching staff and our team here, be a great mother, continue to grow as a coach and a leader during this time that's a little bit slower. Right. And try to serve other coaches while I have a little extra time. And uh, I have no idea. I'm being completely honest. I, I'm on the end of my contract. I don't, I don't have any idea where I'll be or what I'll be doing uh, come this summer, come, come this fall. And I, I don't really care. I know I'll be where I'm supposed to be. And, uh, and it'll be good. Absolutely. No, absolutely it will. So take us through, take us through a day in the life of an assistant NBA coach. Like, what are your responsibilities and, you know, what is, you know, what is it that you do on a daily basis? Okay, I will, I will say that. But I, I am going to go back and answer. I forgot to answer this part. Will there be a woman coach, head coach in the NBA mm -hmm. in the near future? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's just going to take one organization having the courage. Mm -hmm. um, the timing's going to have to be right. Mm -hmm. And all of the female coaches that are involved need to be busting their tails to prepare when the opportunity comes because you know as a minority when you're one of the first spotlight is is bright right. and you got to represent and we as female coaches in in the w in the nba um even the coach female coaches in the wmba are still a minority mm -hmm. um in the women's league like we have to represent we have a responsibility to represent so that younger women have more more opportunities um but when you get the opportunity got to be ready right now day in the life right now the day in life you mean right now or normally <laughs> normally obviously normally. Yeah, normally. Okay, okay. yeah you know it depends on it. our days are predicated on is it a game day is it a travel day or is it a practice day um we don't have we, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday does not exist in our world. It's practice day, game day, travel day. So depending on which day it is, then that's what our day looks like. Game days, most teams do a shoot around. A lot of teams do them at home. Some teams don't do them on the road. Uh, we have a ton of coaches meeting. So we always meet before we practice, sometimes after as well. Um, game days, shoot around, meetings come back, we're there several hours before the game, warming up our players, uh, watching film with the team, game planning, you know, and then we, then we play. And then most of us coaches stay late after the game, breaking down film before we get home late that night for a home game. Practice day is typical practice day. We have coaches meetings. We have a lot of individual development that we do before practice. Then we have our team practice. And then we usually have individual player development after practice. Um, and then we'll spend the rest of the day, usually as an assistant coach, preparing for the next opponent that we're assigned to. We have five coaches, for example, on the Dallas Mavericks staff, and we rotate who's game planning for the opponent. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that takes, you know, a couple weeks, 10 days to a couple weeks to prepare. You're going to watch like five, six games of the team that you're preparing for, and you got a huge report you got to prepare for the team and and for the coaching staff. So we, we have a lot of time watching video, studying other teams. Um, and then travel days, you know, much in the same, except you're going to be on and off the airplane, on and off buses and in and out of hotels, you know, doing the same thing, whether it's a, a practice day or game day. Absolutely. And so, and we talked, you know, you talked about it um, a little bit earlier. Now, not only do you have those responsibilities, but how do you balance being a single mom and an MB and, and an NBA coach? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a day-to-day -day adventure. Um, you know, trying to juggle all of this. I think the biggest key that I've found, and I'm not great at it, but is whichever one I'm doing, whether I'm doing work, or I'm spending time with my daughter being present mm -hmm. in, in that place. It's really easy when you're a working parent 
um, to feel guilty all the time. Like when you're working that you're not spending more time with your family, when you're with your family that you're not spending more time working and that guilt can eat you alive and it disables you from enjoying either thing and, and actually being good at either thing. So I think that's a huge key for working parents is, um, is trying to whichever one you're choosing to do when you've allocated the time, be present and forget about the other, other thing. And then when you go to do the other thing, then, you know, you're fully, fully present there, given your, you're giving your all to, to that, that part of your life. Easier said than done though. Nah, it sounds, it sounds like it. So I have um, a question from uh, one of my people. So you mentioned Ron Rothstein as your father in the game. Yeah. Were there other, who are your other mentors in this game? Yeah. So I grew up in Tennessee and Pat Summit was, uh, was just, I mean, she's one of my, my idols in that, you know, she was one of the first women, if not the first, that was respected by mainstream, you know, white men looked mm -hmm. up to Pat Summit and she had that perfect mix of power mm -hmm. uh, and grace and class and tender heartedness towards people. And you hear stories all the time about you see her on the court, you know how fierce she is. You know what a great competitor she is, but you hear stories all the time about the kindness that she showed to janitors and and waitresses and and people that could do nothing for her. And you know, but the stories are like legendary. She was just she never changed in her kindness and her love uh, and her genuineness for people. Um, so I've always admired her a lot, just especially growing up in Tennessee and really hearing the personal stories of of how she treated people. And um, mm -hmm. and was able to to be the balance of both, um, you know. Debbie Ryan, my college coach, huge influence, great friend. Um, never met anybody Betty, anybody more honest, and that's hard to to sustain in our business. Mm -hmm. um, you know that integrity. Um, my high school coach was a star. I mean, no one will ever know who he is, but he probably shaped me as much as anybody other than my parents. Um, I could tell stories about him that would entertain you guys forever, but he was a Pat Summit prodigy. So he went to the university of Tennessee and watched all her practices and stuff. So he wouldn't even probably be able to coach nowadays the way that he coached because it would be like lawsuits everywhere, but he made, he made <laughs> us tough and he made us about team and he made us about the right stuff. And like I said, I could tell you stories for days, but he, he was a man of principle and he instilled a lot of those principles in me. Just to give you an example, um, you know, I, was, I led the state in scoring, I don't know, as a sophomore, I think, but I didn't know it because we weren't allowed to see a stat sheet. If, if we saw a stat sheet or if we looked at a newspaper, we were suspended. So wow. if he found out we saw a stat sheet, we, we looked at a newspaper, we were suspended. So I never even knew I led the state in scoring. I found out years later. But he was worried, you know, because you have a player that's – I was at a small academic school. Other players start standing around watching when you have a player that's dominant. Mm -hmm. So he told me as a sophomore, the first half of every game, you cannot shoot unless it's an offensive rebound or a steal. Mm -hmm. The first half of the game, you got to involve your teammates, empower them, figure out how to get them going. Second half, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So I was young, you know. I didn't question the coach. Um, but that was a principle that I, that I never forgot. Like, it's about empowering others. It's not about getting yours. And you're going to need them. <laughs> you're going to need them no matter how good you are. Right. And so that's one example of a million. But the guy, was he was brilliant. And uh, so he's another one that I'm very, very thankful for. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And so one of my questions is, you know, now that, you know, you know, that there are female coaches in the NBA. Um, so like, you know, like in the off season, like guys are working out with all types of trainers around the country. You have your, you know, your Drew Hanlins and, you know, of the world. When do you think that we'll see like that Drew Hanlon on the female side that, you know, so do like, like, who helps Diana Taurasi in the summertime? Like, where does Sue Bird go to get better? You know, because you, you, you never see what, what the females are doing in the, you know, in the summertime with trainers. You always see all the NBA players. So, mm -hmm. like, that's where I see it going now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so 
what do you think about that? Like female, you know, when would you see like WNBA players going to the to the female trainers as yeah. opposed to uh, maybe a male trainer? Yeah, I think there's an opportunity there. I think, um, you know, a lot of our players do play overseas, so there's not as mm. much room for it because they're playing right. all year long. Right. Um, you know, I know the 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 lady who trains Sue Bird, Brianna Stewart, a lot of the Olympians. Um, not necessarily the basketball part of it, but to get them being the tip-top athletes that they are and their nutrition mm -hmm. and their strength training and their, their um, you know, agility and whatever. She's like the best sports science person I've ever seen, male or female. Um, mm -hmm. Her name is Susan Borchard. She played at Stanford way back when. Um, she is unbelievable. Her, I think her Instagram is the athlete blueprint, but she's unbelievable. Um, so she's a female that's that's paving the way, um, but there's not a lot of on court female right. player development coaches. Most of our women go to NBA guys. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work with Sue a lot in the off season, but that's just because we went back so long and so far, and I was very mm -hmm. familiar with her game and what she needed to to work on to to be her best. Um, there's not there's not a lot out there. That's a great opportunity if there's some young females out there that want to get a niche to get up mm -hmm. under some of these these established guys offer your services you almost always have to offer as an intern and volunteer mm -hmm. learn the tricks of the trade you know and and make yourself great at it because there's opportunity there yeah that's 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 definitely the way that that's definitely the way that i see it so before we get out of here i got some um i got some quick hitters yeah yeah uh for you to um for you to answer so you played at Virginia for four years. Who was the toughest girl that you had to play against at Virginia? You know, Katie Smith, I'd say, was, was one of the toughest, but um, had some fun battles with Marion Jones, if you remember her from the Olympics. Mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to keep up with her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had, they were a, a big rival of ours. We played Tennessee a couple times. Shamika Holdsclaw was there. Mm -hmm. She was obviously tough. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say, you know, Katie was probably the, the toughest matchup that I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, in your coaching, in your head coaching in the WNBA. Yeah. Who was the who was the one the one woman that you just didn't have any answers for when you coached? Like you tried every adjustment everything and you just couldn't contain it i mean cynthia cooper to me like no one will even hardly remember her but she was just unstoppable you know obviously lisa leslie was somebody that was really 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 a challenge um so let's see more of the current day i mean diana was a load tarasi mm -hmm. she was a load but i but i tell people all the time the most dominant female player I ever saw, I got to see every day, and that's Lauren Jackson. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, like people won't even remember her because she got injured young and she's Australian. But um, Sue, Sue Bird and I sit around sometimes and just tell stories reminiscent of some of the stuff she did because it just make you shake your head.
controls the defense and gets the defense to do what he wants so that he can do what he wants. Right. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, like how, mm -hmm. how he can control the defense and the game and basically have the game form and shape and do exactly what he wants. And he's seeing it that far in advance, um, way ahead of everybody else on the court. So it's, it's a savantness that is just in him that's innate that is, to me, what makes him the most special. Okay. Nice. Nice answer. And my last, my last question is this. Um, hypothetically speaking, I have a daughter, and she wants to get into coaching. What advice would you have for my daughter? Yeah. Find some great mentors. And they don't have to be big names, but find some great teachers of the game and shadow them. Volunteer, do whatever you got to do and ask questions and learn from them. Ask them if, if they will be your mentor and try to follow them around and learn as much as you can because you learn a lot more by what you, what you, what's caught than what's taught. And so you got to be around great coaches to be a great coach. Um, there's a lot of resources online. I think those are great, but I still don't think it's as good as being up under somebody because you get a lot of scattered information and sometimes it's hard to put it all together as opposed to being under somebody and really catching, you know, all these nuances that, that may not even be verbalized of how they're building you know, and empowering and, you know, establishing and um, installing and adjusting, you know, you're watching it from start to finish as opposed right. to piecemeal. So I, I can't think of anything more important than, than mentorship. Um, and also like, there's a lot of people who want to get into coaching. I always say, just check yourself too, that you're doing it for the right reasons. It's not that it's, it's really like, what you love because it's a grind mm -hmm. people players don't realize how how many hours go into coaching most players get into coaching hate